Hi, everybody, and welcome to part six of the Beginner's Crash Course. We have uh, Lisa Jung back again for um, our sixth installment. Super excited to, to kick things off. Um, and what else do I need to tell you? Um, if you have questions that come up during the session, just feel free to put them in the chat and um, we will uh, block some time, try to block some time at the end to get those answered and responded to um, if we're able. If not, then um, Lisa will address them in the GitHub repo for um, this particular part of the beginner's crash course. Um, so without further ado, Lisa, I'll hand things over to you and um, just let me know if you're ready to jump into the presentation and I'll uh, add that. Yeah, I'm ready. All right, Let's awesome. Do. Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to the Beginner's Crash Course through Elasticstack. My name is Lisa Jung and I'm a developer advocate at Elastic. So today we're covering part six of the Beginner's Crash Course series. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, this is a series of workshops for developers and it's geared towards beginners who wanna get started with the Elasticstack. So the stack is made up of four products, Beats, Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana. And with the stack, you can take data from any source in any format, then search, analyze, and visualize in real time. So throughout the series, we've been focusing on Elasticsearch and Kibana. So far, we learned about how Elasticsearch and Kibana works and how you can use these products to fine tune the relevance of your search. And we learned about full text search, aggregations, and mapping. Now, a quick announcement, we're wrapping up season one of the Beginner's Crash Course with part six. Now, I'll tell you more about the future plans at the end of the workshop, but I thought it'd be a really nice way to wrap up this season by revisiting the topics and troubleshooting errors associated with these topics. So as usual, I'll be showing you how to do this in Elasticsearch in Kibana. So here are the prerequisites for part six. Now, if you've completed parts one through five, you've already completed steps one and two. So feel free to skip this part. But for those of you who are joining us for the first time, you have to complete the prerequisites to keep up. So first, we need to set up and run Elasticsearch in Kibana. Then we add two data sets, news headlines, and e-commerce data to Elasticsearch. Then we have two windows open side by side. One window will display the Kibana console, also known as DevTools, and the other window will have the part six repo. So to complete step one, go to the link here. Faith will be dropping this link in the chat. And when you click on this link, it'll take you to the table of contents for Beginner's Crash Course. So for those of you who are new, I create a GitHub repo for each workshop. And these repos contain all the resources shared during the workshop, including the presentation slides and the recording. Now, this link includes the table of contents for all repos shared during the series. So to complete step one, click on part two. And when you get there, scroll down to the resources section and click on the video of the workshop. Watch the video from timestamp 15 through 2146. And this section will show you how to set up Elasticsearch in Kibana and add news headline data set to Elasticsearch. Once you've done that, go back to the table of contents and click on part four. And once you pull up the repo, look under the resources section, then down to e-commerce data set from Kaggle. Now, when you click on that link, it'll take you to the e-commerce data set and download and unzip the data, then follow the same video to add this data set to Elasticsearch. Now, when you do so, you'd have completed steps one and two. And the video clip will lead you to the Kibana homepage, all you have to do is to click on DevTools and have it pulled up in one window. Then go back to the table of contents and pull up part six repo in another window. All right, so let me get organized here real quick. Okay, 
So I have two windows open. On the left, we have the Kibana console, and on the right, I have the Part 6 repo. And for the rest of the workshop, we'll be sending requests from Kibana to Elasticsearch to troubleshoot error messages. So let's take a look at the Part 6 repo on the right, which contains all the resources that are shared during the workshop. Now, so throughout the series, we've learned how to send all sorts of requests to Elasticsearch. And whenever we send a request, Elasticsearch sends us the HTTP status and the response body. And when the request is carried out successfully, you get an HTTP status that starts with number two and whatever information you've requested in the response body. Now, while you're working with Elasticsearch, you probably ran into some errors. And when this happens, the HTTP status and the response body will provide valuable clues about why the request failed. But when you're a beginner, it's hard to even understand what the error message is saying. So often, you don't even know where to start. And I find that just the act of seeing different types of error messages and learning how to troubleshoot makes it less intimidating. So to keep things simple, we're going to limit our scope and we'll focus on errors you might see while working with requests from previous workshops. And we're going to learn how to interpret these error messages and how we should approach troubleshooting these errors. So there could be a variety of reasons why you're encountering an error message. Now, I've listed some common errors you might see while working with Elasticsearch. But as a beginner, you're most likely to see 4xx errors, meaning you'll see an HTTP status starting with 4. And when you see this error, it means that the request was not written correctly. And we have to fix the request before sending it again. So to solidify our understanding of the rules of Elasticsearch requests, we'll only focus on 4xx errors today. OK, so whenever we see an error message, it's really helpful to go through the thought process for troubleshooting errors. And this will help you narrow down the cause and find the resources to help you fix the error. So, when you see an error, the first thing you should pay attention to is the HTTP status. What number does it start with? So as a beginner, you'll most likely see HTTP status that starts with number four. Now, the next thing that you're going to do is to read through the entire error message. The chances are it'll even point out the line where the mistake was made or give you further clues about why the request failed. Next, use the Elasticsearch documentation as your guide. So compare your request with the examples from the documentation. Where does it differ? Then make appropriate changes. Now, there will be times where the error messages are just not helpful, if not misleading. So we'll cover how to approach these types of error messages as well. So throughout the series, we've learned how to send requests that are related to these topics. We learned how to perform CRUD operations, send queries, perform aggregations, and view and customize mappings. So we'll revisit each topic and troubleshoot common errors. And we're going to do that by applying the thought process that we just went over. OK. So in part one, we went over CRUD operations. In other words, how to create, read, update, and delete a document in Elasticsearch. So let's say we want to retrieve a document with an ID of one from index common errors. So let's copy and paste that into the console. Make sure to select and send. Now, you'll see a 404 error in the HTTP status. 
And when you see an HTTP status starting with four, it's telling you that something isn't quite right with the request that we sent. Now, the next thing you should do is to go to the response body and look for clues. So let's look at line five. It says error type index not found exception. On line six, the reason is no such index, common errors. Now, the two possible explanation for this error are that the index common errors truly does not exist or was deleted, or we don't have the correct index name. Now, in our case, the error is quite clear, right? We haven't created an index called common errors, and we're asking to retrieve a document from a non-existing index. So let's create an index called common errors. And the syntax is put followed by name of the index. So let's copy and paste that into the console. Make sure to select and send. Now, you'll see a 200 success response saying that index common errors has been successfully created. OK, so now that we have created the index, let's index a document. So let's say you remember that you could use put to index a document. So you write out this request. So here you're saying put the following document into index common errors. So let's copy and paste that into the console. Make sure to select and send. Now you'll see a four or five error and the HTTP status starts with four, meaning that there's gotta be a mistake in the request somewhere. So let's take, it the, take a look at the response body for the error message. And it says incorrect HTTP method for URI and method put allowed post. So the HTTP method is referring to the verb that you put at the beginning of the request. And it's saying that either put is not supposed to be there or the combination of the of put and the URI doesn't work. So at this point, you might say, hmm, I remember in part one, I learned about indexing documents with either put or post. Maybe I mix up the syntax. So this would, be a, this would be a great time to check out part one repo. I included the link here and the excerpts from the repo here. Now, when indexing a document, HTTP verb put or post can be used. And you use put when you want to assign a specific ID to your document. And the syntax for that is put followed by name of the index document endpoint, an ID you want to assign to this document. So let's take a look at the request that we just sent. Now we're using put followed by name of the index and document endpoint. But we're missing an ID that we want to assign to this document. And Elasticsearch notices, notices this and throws an error. So why does Elasticsearch suggest that we use post instead? So let's go down to the post indexing request. Now you use post when you want Elasticsearch to auto-generate an ID for your document. In that case, you use the syntax post followed by name of the index, then the document endpoint. Now let's take a look at the request that we just sent. We're using the identical syntax for post, but we're using the verb put. So Elasticsearch assumes that you meant to send a post indexing request and tell, tells you to fix it. Now, depending on whether we want to assign an ID or not, we could fix this error in two different ways. So if you want to assign an ID, this ID to this document, we use the put syntax and include the ID here. So let's copy and paste that into the console. Make sure to select and send. 
Now you'll get a 201 success message and you'll see that document with an assigned ID of one has been created. Now, what if we actually wanted Elasticsearch to auto-generate an ID for us? So let's scroll down to post. And we use the post syntax, which doesn't include the, the document ID here. So let's copy and paste that, the correct example, into the console. Make sure to select and send. And you'll see that document with an has been created. Okay, so let's move on to the next error. So earlier, we created a document with an ID of one. Now let's say we wanted to add more fields to this document. In other words, update document one. Now in part one, we learned how to update a document. And to do so, we say, hey, post to common errors index. I want you to update document with an ID of one. I'm adding the doc here to let you know, I don't wanna overwrite the original content. Just add the following fields, error and solution to what's already there. So let's copy and paste this into the console. Make sure to select and send. Now, you'll see a 400 error message. And if you look at line 12, it's caused by error type JSON parse exception. And it lists the reason here. Now, at first glance, this looks like foreign language, but we don't need to digest all of this to figure out the cause of the error. So let's hone in on the uh, keywords here. So it says it was expecting comma to separate object entries at line four. So this object in question is referring to the doc object here. And object entries are the fields included within the doc object. So let's ignore all this stuff after source, not applicable to us. And we see line four here. And this tells us that the mistake is somewhere around line four. This is where you should start looking for a mistake. So essentially, Elasticsearch is telling you which syntax rules are not being followed. The error message is saying, hey, if you have multiple fields within an object, you have to separate the fields with commas. You're missing a comma on line four. So let's take a look at our requests. In our doc object, we have two fields, but they're not separated by a comma. So add a comma here and send the request. And it successfully updates document one. Okay, so, oops. all right. So we just covered common errors you may encounter while performing CRUD operations. That was part one. And in parts two and three, we focused on queries. And queries retrieve documents that match the specified criteria. Now, as a prerequisite, we added a news headlines data set to an index we named news headlines. Then we sent various queries to retrieve documents that we're interested in. So let's cover common errors that you can encounter while sending queries. So in part two, we're exploring our data set and seeing what types of questions we would like to ask. And we thought it'd be interesting to see the headlines that were published within a specific date range. So we learned how to use the range query. So let's say we sent the following requests. We say, get search results from news headlines index. I want you to query documents from a certain time period. So the type of query I'm sending is range. The following are criteria for documents in my search results. Only look at the field date 
and grab me all headlines that were published between these two dates. So let's copy and paste the request into the console. Make sure to select and send. Now, you'll see a 400 error, so you should immediately know that something's off with our request. Now, the error type is parsing exception. And the reason for that is because the range query does not support date. Now, unfortunately, this error message is downright misleading. So the range query retrieves any documents that contain terms within a provided range. And the fact that you're performing a range query on date field doesn't matter. It should be able to do it. So whenever you encounter a confusing error message, the next step is to go to the documentation and search for range query in the search bar. Now, let's go back to our repo. Now, I included the link to Elastic Documentation as well as the screenshots from the documentation. So here you should see the syntax for the range query. It's query followed by range, then the field that you want to run range query on, then the bounds of the range. Now you'll see that there are curly brackets around the bounds of the range query. And if we look at our request, we forgot to add these brackets. So the rule is that if a field such as date contains inner fields, you always have to put curly brackets around the inner fields. So let's copy and paste that into the console. Make sure to select and send. And you'll see that you get a 200 success status. And if you look at the hits, you'll see news headlines that were published within the date range that we provided here. Okay, so in part two, we also learned about the multi-match query. And this query allows you to search for same search terms in multiple fields at one time. So for example, this request is asking to get search results from news headlines index. I want you to query all documents. Just a heads up. You're going to search through multiple fields. Look up the terms party planning in the field, headline, and short description. Now remember that the multi-match query acts like a match query, meaning that it uses OR logic and it pulls up documents that contain the term party or planning. So this leads to getting loosely related hits. So to improve the precision of our search, we add the parameter type phrase to the multi-match query. So our query would look for the phrase party planning. So let's copy and paste that into the console. Make sure to select and send. And you'll see that we get a 400 error. And the type of error is parsing exception. And the reason is multi-match malform query, expected end object, but found field name around line 10. Now, this is also a very vague error message that doesn't really tell us what's wrong, but we do know that the error is coming from somewhere around line 10. So perhaps it has to do with the type parameter we added to the multi-match query. So the next thing we might think about is, well, was a parameter type placed in the wrong place? So what we're going to do is to check the opening and close brackets from outside in. So first is the outermost curly brackets that includes a the query. Then we have curly brackets that contains the type of query, which is the multi-match query. Then we have curly brackets that contain the definition of the multi-match query. Now, when you do this, you'll see that the parameter type 
is actually placed outside of the multi-match query. And that's why Elasticsearch couldn't parse this request. So let's move the type phrase to line 10. Then we're going to remove this comma here and add it to line 9 and send the request. Now, you'll see a 200 success status. Let's look at the hits. Now, in the field short description, you'll see the phrase party planning. In the field headline, you'll also see the phrase party planning as well. So everything worked as it should. Now, let's move on to the next error. So when we search for something, we often ask a multifaceted question. So for example, let's say you want to retrieve entertainment news headlines published on 2018, April 12th. Now, in order to answer this question, we need to write two queries. So a query that retrieves documents from the entertainment category, and another that retrieves documents that were published on 2018-04-12. So let's say you write out the request here. So here you're saying, get search results from news headlines index. I want you to query all documents that match the following criteria. Pull up all documents whose category field contains the value entertainment and also whose date field contains the value 2018-04-12. So let's, like, let's copy and paste this into the console. Make sure to select and send. Now you'll see a 400 error message and the type is parsing exception. And the reason is that match query doesn't support multiple fields, bound category and field. So what this message is saying is that the match query can query one field at a time. So we can't include multiple fields within one match query. So if you want to combine multiple match queries into one request, you might want to consider using the bool query. Now we learned about this in part three, and with the bool query, you can combine multiple queries into one request, and you can further specify Boolean clauses to narrow down your search results. Now the query offers four must, must not, should, and filter. And you can mix and match any of these clauses to get the relevant search results that you want. Now, in our case, we have two queries, a query that retrieves documents from the entertainment category and another that retrieves documents were published on 2018, April uh, 12th. So a news headline could be either from the entertainment category or not. So this falls into yes or no category. And a news headline could be published on 2018-04-12 or not. So this also falls into the yes or no category. So in this case, we'll use the filter clause and include two match queries within it. So this is a request we're going to send. Get followed by name of the index, then the search endpoint. Here, I'm sending a bool query where all hits fall into the yes category for the following. All hits will match the term entertainment in the category field. They should also match the term 2018-04-12 in the date field. So let's copy and paste that into the console. Make sure to select and send. Now you'll see that you get a 200 success response. And if you examine the hits, all the hits were published on 2018, April 12th. And these are from the category entertainment. Okay. So we just went over errors associated, associated with queries. 
Next, we're going to cover errors related to aggregations and mapping. Now, in part four, we learned about aggregations. And aggregations allow you to summarize your data as metrics, statistics, and other analytics. So for example, let's say we're interested in getting the summary of categories that exist in our data set. And since this requires summarizing your data, you decide to send the aggregations request. So here, what you're saying is get search results from news headlines index. By the way, this is an aggregations request, which I'll name by category. Run a terms aggregations on the field category and give me the summary of unique categories that exist in my data set. So let's copy and paste that into the console. Make sure to select and send. Now, by default, it shows you the top 10 hits followed by aggregations results. Now, you'll notice that in order to get to the aggregations results, you have to scroll down quite a bit. Now, when you're only interested in looking at the aggregations results and not the hits, there's a cool trick for that. So in part four, I introduced you to the size parameter. And when the size parameter is set to zero, Elasticsearch omits the hits so we can get straight to the aggregations results. So this is almost identical to the request we just sent, except that right below ags, we add a size parameter and set it equal to zero. So let's copy and paste that into the console. Make sure to select and send. And you'll see that we get a 400 error of the type parsing exception. And the reason is aggregation definition for size starts with a value number. Expected a start object somewhere around line three. So it seems like we made some kind of syntax error here around line three. So this would be a great time to go to the Elastic documentation and search for aggregations. Now, I included a link here along with the screenshots from the documentation. So the syntax is get followed by name of the index, then search endpoint. You declare that you want to perform aggregation, then specify the name of the aggregation. And this is what Elasticsearch refers to as a start object. Then the rest looks exactly like our request. So we have a size parameter in a place where the start object, the name of the aggregation should be. So at this point, you might be wondering, well, where do I place a size parameter then? Now, if you scroll down, to the documentation to return on the aggregations results section, you'll see that the size parameter is placed outside of the aggregations request. So below, I've included the correct example. So let's copy and paste that into the console. Make sure to select and send. And you'll see that the hits are omitted and you get aggregations results, which is an array of categories in our data set. All right, so troubleshooting the next error requires knowledge about both aggregations and mapping. So in parts four and five, we worked with e-commerce data. In part four, we added the e-commerce data set to Elasticsearch and named the index e-commerce original data. Then we pulled up part four repo, scroll down to set up data within Elasticsearch section and follow these steps. And we're gonna focus on why we had to follow these first two steps. So step one, we create a new index e-commerce data with a new mapping. Then we re-index the data 
from original index to the new index we just created. Now, I've never explained why I had you go through these steps. Well, this has to do with the error message we're about to see next. So from this point on, imagine that we had just added the original data set into an index called e-commerce original data. At this point, we haven't completed steps one and two. So during part four, we learned how to group data into buckets based on time interval. This is known as date histogram aggregation. So here is a date histogram aggregations we cover during part four. We say get search results from e-commerce original data. I'm only interested in aggregations results, so don't fetch the top 10 hits. I'm sending an aggregations request here, which I'll name transactions by eight hours. I want you to group data into buckets based on time interval. So the type of aggregation you should run is a date histogram. Run this on the field invoice date and the time interval I want is a fixed interval of eight hours. So let's copy and paste that into the console. Make sure to select and send. Now you'll see a 400 error and the type is a legal argument exception. And the reason is that field invoice date of type keyword is not supported for aggregation date histogram. Now, your immediate reaction may be to look for syntax errors, but in this case, the syntax of our request is correct. So if you hone in on the error message, it mentions that the field invoice date is typed as keyword, and this field type is not suitable for date histogram aggregation. So based on what we've learned, when you hear the term field type, you know that you're dealing with mapping. So let's double check on the mapping. So we went over this in part five. To check the mapping, we use get followed by name of the index, then the mapping endpoint. So let's copy and paste this into the console. Make sure to select and send. All right, so here's the mapping. Now remember, when we added this data, we didn't specify a mapping in advance. So by default, it dynamically created the mapping for us. And you'll see that the field invoice date is typed as keyword. So let's check out what field type is needed for date histogram aggregation. Now I've included the link to the documentation here and the screenshots from documentation. Read the first sentence. It says date histogram aggregation can only be used with date or date range values. Now, I'm going to resend our aggregations request to get the error message again. And what this error is saying is, hey, you're trying to perform date histogram aggregation on the field invoice date but its field type is not date. So do something about it. So this requires us to change the mapping, the field type of invoice date to date. But remember, you cannot change the mapping of an existing field. The only way you can accomplish this is to step one, create a new index with a new uh, with a desired mapping. Step two, re-index data from original index to the new one. And step three, send the date history aggregations request to the new index. Now in part four, this is why I had you follow steps one and two before our aggregations workshop. So let's go over step one. Now we're gonna create a new index called e-commerce data. So start the request by put followed by e-commerce data. Next, I'm going to resend the request to get the mapping of the original index. Then 
I'm going to copy the whole thing and paste it below. Okay, now we're going to delete the name of the original index along with its opening and closing brackets. Okay, now, do you see this meta field here? Now this unfortunately caused a lot of confusion for people who are following along with my workshop. So let me clarify that. So the meta field is a space for any notes that you wanna include as a reference. It could be tips about common bugs you encounter with your app or any info that you wanna include. And this field is completely optional and you don't need to include it if you don't want to. Now, last time I ac accidentally omitted this underscore in front of meta in the mapping I included in the part four repo. So when people are following along, they were getting a 400 error. Root mapping definition has unsupported parameters meta. And all of that was caused by omitting this underscore before meta field here. Now, for our use case, the meta field is really not necessary. So I'm just going to delete it here. Now, we got meta field out of the way. And so we're going to fix the field invoice date. Now, we're going to change the type to date. I'm also going to add the format of the date in our data set here. Okay. So to get the format, what I did was I retrieved documents from my index. Then I looked up the invoice date field of one of the documents. And the date format in our data set is month, day, four digit year, hour, and minutes. So that's what I included in the format here. And the symbols that I used to specify the format was retrieved from the documentation where I link, which I linked here, right? Now, afterwards, you'll select the request and sent, and that was step one. Now, I've already sent this request in advance, so I won't send it again. But that was a lot. So let's recap real quick. So the reason why we're doing all of this is because Elasticsearch throws on error when we send the date histogram aggregations request. And that's because when we added the e-commerce data for the first time, Elasticsearch dynamically mapped the field invoice date to keyword. Date histogram aggregations request, the request failed because the field invoice date needed to be typed as date. And since we couldn't change a mapping of an existing field, we had to create a new index, which we named e-commerce data with customized mapping. And within the mapping, we specify the field type of invoice date to date. We also specify the date format. Now, at this point, we have a new index, but there's no data in it. And that's why we did step two, where we re-index the data from original index um, to the new index. So to do so, you say post followed by the index. Then you name the source, which is the original index that contains the data set. Then you name the destination, which is a new index with a customized mapping. And this will re-index the data set from original index to the new index. Now, I've already sent this ahead of time, so we don't need to send it again. So now that all that's done, let's send the date histogram aggregations request we sent earlier. So this is almost identical to the original request, except that the index name has been changed to the new index. So let's copy and paste that into the console. Make sure to select and send. 
and we got an array of buckets with eight hour time interval. All right. So by setting the right field type for date histogram aggregation, we're able to fix this error. All right, so let's go over our last error. Now, one of the cool things about Elasticsearch is that you could build any combination of aggregations to answer more complex questions. So for example, in part four, we asked what if we want to get the daily revenue and the number of unique customers per day. Now, this requires grouping data into daily buckets then, within each bucket, calculating the daily revenue and number of unique customers per day. So let's say we wrote the following request. So here it's saying, get search results from e-commerce data, not interested in the hits, so fetch me the aggregations results. I'm naming my aggregations re request transactions per day. And the type of aggregation I want you to run is date histogram aggregation. Look at the field invoice date and group documents into daily buckets. Within each bucket, I want you to calculate the daily revenue and number of unique customers per day. So let's copy and paste that into the console. And send. Now, you'll see that we get a 400 error, and it says the, the type is parsing exception. The reason is it found two aggregation type definitions in transactions per day, date histogram and daily revenue. And the mistake is coming from somewhere around line nine. Now, this error is occurring because the structure of our aggregations requests is wrong. Now, to get the values that we want, we group data into daily buckets. And within each bucket, we're calculating the daily revenue and number of unique customers per day. So this is actually an aggregation within aggregation. So to express this structure, you have to add the sub aggregations here and enclose the daily revenue and number of unique customers per day with curly brackets. So let's copy and paste this. Oh, this is a big request into the console. Make sure to select and send. Now, you'll see that we get an array of daily buckets. Here's December 1st. Here's December 2nd, and so on. And within each bucket, it calculates the number of unique customers per day and daily revenue. Okay, so that is all I've got for you today. So I hope you found that helpful. So about those unhelpful error messages that we went put in a request to make the error messages more clear. So hopefully that will change soon. Okay. All right. So before we get to questions, I want to make an announcement first. So today's workshop was the last workshop of season one of the Beginner's Crash Course. So here's what's coming up next. So for season two, I wanted to make the content more digestible for all of you. So instead of doing a live hour long workshop, I'll be creating a series of short clips that are 10 minutes or less. So from this point on, we won't be hosting these live workshops, but you will get access to these shorter clips more frequently. Now, I'll upload these clips to the same YouTube playlist so you could access it readily. And you can find a playlist in the table of contents repo that we shared with you earlier. So here's my game plan. First, I'm going to create short clips for the content from season one. Then I'll write more blogs on these topics. And once these are done, I'm gonna work on season two. And this is where you come in. 
So the whole point of this is to cover topics that'd be helpful for you. So I created a poll to see what you would like to see in season two. And once I get your feedback, I'll create content on most requested topics along with other topics that you'll find helpful. So the link to the poll is on the screen and I see that Faith already dropped the poll in the chat. Thank you. Now, speaking of season two, one of the requests that I get is, you know, are you going to, are you going to create content on Beats and Logstash? Well, I originally planned on covering all four products of the Elastic Stack. However, I have an amazing colleague named Ricardo Ferreira, and he's creating a great series about data ingestion related products, such as Beats, Elastic Agent, and Logstash. And it seemed redundant for both of us to cover the same topics. So I'm going to keep my focus on Elastic Search and Kibana. But if you want to learn more about Beats, check out Ricardo's playlist. So he's currently focusing on Beats, but he's planning on covering Elastic Agent and Logstash in the future. And the links to his content are included here. And Faith, drop the list or drop the links in the chat. All right. So we are coming to the top of the hour. I'm going to see if there are any um, questions, quick questions that I could answer. Let me look. Wait, do we do we get any questions? Um, I don't see it in the. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that there are any um, questions right now. Oh, was it that like crystal clear or? I think so. Lots of kudos to you on the series so far, Lisa. But yeah, I don't see any questions quite yet. Um, so folks, while you're here, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, um, I would recommend subscribing. So that way when Lisa posts um, the shorter clip version of season one and also the um, season two videos, you'll get notified. So again, make sure that you're subscribed to the channel so that you're staying up to date on those. Um, and if there aren't any other questions, Lisa, thank you so much for um, diving into this. This has been really awesome. Um, always, always a pleasure to have you on the channel. And um, I know that folks really ha uh, love and enjoy your series. We have had a bunch of people saying how much they like uh, the series in the chat. So um, thanks again for, for being here. Of course. And thank you, Faith, for helping me host this series. It has been a lot of fun. So yeah, I guess we'll just wrap up here. So thank you so much for coming. And I hope you can join us for season two. Awesome. Bye, everybody.